white and turbid wake. Pale waters, paler cheeks, where'er I sail. The envious billows sidelong swell to weld my track. Let them. But first, I pass. Yonder by the ever brimming goblet's rim, the warm waves blush like wine. The gold brow plums the blue. The diver's sun, slow dived from noon, goes down. My soul mounts up. She wearies with her endless hill. Is then the crown too heavy that I wear? This iron crown of Lombardy? Yet is it bright with many a gem? Neither wearer see not its far flashings, but darkly feel that I wear that that dazzlingly compounds. Tis iron, that I know, not gold. Tis split, too, that I feel. The jagged edge galls me so, my brain seems to beat against the solid metal. I, steel skull mine, the sort that needs no helmet in the most brain-battering fight. Try heat upon my brow, or oh, time was when as the sunrise nobly spurred me, so the sunset soothed. No more. This lovely light, it lights not me. All loveliness is anguish to me, so I can ne'er enjoy. Gifted with the high perception, I lack the low enjoying power. Damned most subtly and most malignantly. Damned in the midst of paradise. Good night. Good night. was not so hard a task. I thought to find one stubborn at the least, but my one cog circle fits into all their various wheels, and they revolve. Or if you will, like so many anthills of powder, they all stand before me, and I their match. Oh, hard that to fire others, the match itself must needs be wasting. What I've dared, I've willed, and what I've willed, I'll do. They think me mad. Starbuck does, but I'm demoniac. I am madness, maddened. That wild madness that's only calm to comprehend itself. The prophecy was that I should be dismembered, and I, I lost this leg. I now prophesy that I will dismember my dismemberer. Now then be the prophet and the fulfiller one. More than any ye great gods ever were. I laugh and hoot at ye, ye cricket players, ye pugilists, ye deaf burks and blinded bendigos. I will not say, as schoolboys do to bullies, take someone of your own size, don't pommel me. No. You've knocked me down, and I am up again, but ye have run and hidden. Come forth from behind your cotton bags. I have no long gun to reach ye. Come, Ahab's compliments to you. Come and see if ye can swerve me. Swerve me? Ye cannot swerve me, else ye swerve yourselves. Man has ye there. Swerve me. The path to my fixed purpose is laid with iron rails whereon my soul is grooved to run over unsounded gorges through the rifled hearts of mountains, under torrents' beds. Unerringly I rush, not an obstacle, not an angle to the iron way. Chapter 38 Dusk By the mainmast, Starbuck leaning against it. My soul is more than matched. She's overmanned and by a madman. Insufferable sting that sanity should ground arms on such a field. But he drilled deep down and blasted all my reason out of me. I think I see his impious end, but feel that I must help him to it. 
Will I, nil I, the ineffable thing has tied me to him, toes me with a cable I have no knife to cut. Horrible old man. Who's over him, he cries. Aye, he would be a Democrat to all above. Look how he lords it over all below. Oh, I plainly see my miserable office to obey rebelling and worst yet to hate with a touch of pity. For in his eyes I read some lurid woe would shrivel me up had I it. Yet there is hope. Time and tide flow wide. The hated whale has the round watery world to swim in as the small goldfish has its glassy globe. His heaven insulting purpose God may wedge aside. I would up heart were it not like lead, but my whole clock's run down. My heart, the all controlling weight, I have no key to lift again. A burst of revelry from the forecastle. Oh God, to sail with such a heathen crew that have small touch of human mothers in them, whelped somewhere by the sharkish sea. The white whale is their demigorgon. Hark, the infernal orgies, that revelry is forward. Mark the unfaltering silence aft. Methinks it pictures life. Foremost through the sparkling sea shoots on the gay embattled bantering bow, but only to drag Ahab after it, where he broods within his sternward cabin, build it over the dead water of the wake, and further on, hunted by its wolfish girdlings. The long howl thrills me through. Peace, ye revelers, and set the watch. Oh, life, tis in an hour like this, with soul beat down and held to knowledge, as wild untutored things are forced to feed. Oh, life, tis now that I do feel the latent horror in thee. But tis not me, that horror's out of me. And with the soft feeling of the human in me, yet will I try to fight ye, ye grim phantom futures. Stand by me, hold me, bind me, O ye blessed influences. Chapter 39, First Night Watch. Tour Town. Stubbed Silas and Mending of Brakes. Ha, 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 hem, clear my throat. I've been thinking over it ever since, and that ha ha is the final consequence. Why so? Because the laugh's the wisest, easiest answer to all that's queer, and come what will, one comfort's always left. That unfailing comfort is, it's all predestinated. I heard not all his talk with Starbuck, but to my poor eyes, Starbuck then looked something as I the other evening felt. Be sure the old mogul has fixed him, too. I twig it, knew it, had had the gift, might readily have prophesied it. For when I clapped my eye upon his skull, I saw it. Well, Stub, wise Stub, that's my title. Well, Stub, what of it, Stub? Here's a carcass. I know not all that may be coming, but be it what it will, I'll go to it laughing. Such a waggish leering as lurks in all your horrors. I feel funny. Pa, lira, skira. What's my juicy little pear at home doing now? Crying its eyes out? Giving a party to the last arrived harpooners, I dare say. Gay as a frigate's pennant, and so am I. Pala, lira, skira. Oh, we'll drink tonight with hearts as light, to love as gay and fleeting, as bubbles that swim on the beaker's brim and break on the lips while we ting. A brave stave that. Who calls? Mr. Starbuck? Aye, aye, sir. He's my superior. He has his, too, if I'm not mistaken. Aye, aye, sir. Just through with this job. Coming. Chapter 40, Midnight Foxel. Harpenuers and sailors, foresail rises and discovers the watch standing, lounging, leaning, and lying in various attitudes, all singing in chorus. Farewell and adieu to you, Spanish ladies. Farewell and adieu to you, ladies of Spain. Our captain's commanded. Oh, boys, don't be sentimental. It's bad for the digestion. Take a tonic. Follow me. 
Our captain stood upon the deck with a spyglass in his hand. Are the win of those gallant whales that blew at every strand? Are your tubs in your boats, me boys, by your braces stand? And we'll have one of those fine whales, and boys over hand. So be cheery, me lads, may your hearts never fail. While the bold harponier is striking the whale. Eight bells there forward. I've asked the chorus. Eight bells there, do you hear, bell boy? Strike the bell, eight thou pip, thou blacking, and let me call the watch. I've the sort of mouth for that, the hog's head mouth. So, so, starbolines ahoy! Eight bells there below, tumble up. Grand night, snoozing tonight, matey. Fat night for that. I mark this in our old mogul's wine. It's quite as deadening to some as Philip to others. We sing, they sleep. I lie down there like grown teeter butts. At him again. There, take this copper pump and hail them through it. Tell him to a vast dreaming of their lasses. Tell him it's the resurrection. They must kiss their last and come to judgment. That's the way, that's it. Thy throat ain't spoiled with eating Amsterdam butter. Hist, boys, let's have a jig before we go, uh, before we ride to anchor in Blanket Bay. What say you? There comes the other watch. Watch by, stand by all legs, Pip, little Pip. Hurrah with your tambourine. Don't know where it is. Beat thy belly then and wag thy ears. Jig it, men, I say. Mary's the word. Hurrah. Damn me. Don't, won't you dance? Form now, Indian file, and gallop into the double shuffle. Throw yourselves. Legs, legs. I don't like your floor, matey. It's too springy for my taste. I'm used to ice floors. I'm sorry to throw cold water on the subject, but excuse me. Me too. Where's your girls? Who but a fool would take his left hand by his right and say, how do you do? Partners, I must have partners. I girls in a green, and then I'll hop with ye, ye turn grasshopper. Well, well, ye sulkies, there's plenty more of us. Ho corn when you must, say I. All legs go to harvest soon. Ah, here comes the music now for it. Here you are, Pep, and there's the wind that spits up your mount. Now, boys, go it, Pep, bang it, bellboy, rig it, dig it, jig it, steer it, bellboy, make the fireflies, break the jinglers. Jinglers, you say? There goes another. I drop, it dropped off. I pound it so. Rattle thy teeth then, and pound away. Make a pagoda of thyself. Merry mad, hold up thy hoop, Pip, till I jump through it. Split jibs, tear yourself. That's the white man. He calls that fun. Hm. I save my sweat. I wonder whether those jolly lads bethink them of what they are dancing over. I'll dance over your grave, I will. That's the bitterest threat of your night women that beat Edward's round corners. Oh, Christ, to think of the green navies and the green scold crews. Well, well, belike the whole world's a ball, as you scholars have it, and so tis right to make one ballroom of it. Dance on, lads. You're young. I was once. Smell out! Oh, this is worse than pulling after whales in a calm. Give a whiff. Give a whiff, Tash. <coughs> By Brahma, boys, it'll be dow sail soon. The sky-born high tide Ganges turn to wind. Thou show us thy black brow, Siva. It's the waves. The snows caps turn to jig it now. They'll shake their tassels soon. 
Now, were all the waves were women, then I'd go down and chasse with them evermore. As not so sweet on earth, heaven may not match it as those swift glances of warm, wild bosoms in the dance when the over-arboring arms hide such ripe, bursting grapes. Tell me not of it, hark ye, lad. Fleet interlacings of the limbs, lithe swayings, coyings, fluttering, lip, heart, hip, all grays unceasing touch and go, not taste, observe ye, else comes satiety. Eh, pagan? Hail, holy nakedness of our dancing girls, the heaver, heaver. Ah, low veiled, high palm Tahiti, I still rest me on thy mat, but the soft soil has slid. I saw thee woven in the woods, my mat, green the first day I brought ye thence, now worn and wilted quite. Ah, me, not thou nor I can bear the change. How then, if so transplanted to yon sky, here I the roaring streams, streams from Pirohiti's peak of spears when they leap down the crags and drown the villages. The blast, the blast up spine and meet it. How the sea rolls swashing against the side. Stand by for reefing, hardies. The winds just crossing swords. Pell-mell they'll go lunging presently. Crack, crack, old ship. So long as thou crackest, thou holdest. Well done. The mate there holds ye to it stiffly. He's no more afraid than the isle court at Fort at Cattegat, put there to fight the Baltic with storm-lashed guns on which the sea salt kicks. He has his orders, mind ye, that I heard old Ahab tell him he must always kill a squaw something as they burst a water spout with a pistol. Fire your ship right into it. Blood, but that old man's a grand old cove. We, we are the lads to hand him up his whale. Aye, aye! How the three pines shake. Pines are the hardest sort of tree to live when shifted to any other soil, and here there's none but the crew's cursed clay. Steady, helmsman, steady. This is the sort of weather when brave hearts split ashore and keeled Hulls split at sea. Our captain has his birthmark. Look yonder, boys, there's another in the sky, lurid like, you see. All else pitch black. What of that? Who's afraid of blacks? Afraid of me? I'm quarried out of it. He wants to bully her. The old grudge makes me touchy. Aye, Harpooner, thy race is the undeniable dark side of mankind. Devilish dark at that. No offense. None. That mad Spaniard's mad or drunk. But that can't be, or else in his one case our old mogul's fire waters are somewhat long in working. What's that I saw? Lightning? Yes. No. Dagu showing his teeth. Swallow thine, mannequin. White skin, white liver. Knife thee heartily. Big frame, small spirit. Arrow, arrow, arrow. Arrow alow and arrow aloft. Gods and men, both brawlers. Huh. Arrow, 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 the virgin be blessed, arrow, plunge in with ye. Fair play, snatch the Spaniard's knife, a ring, a ring, ready formed. There, the ring to Risen. In that ring, Cain struck Abel. Sweet work, right work, no? Why then, God, madest thou the ring? 
Hands by the halyards, into gallant sails, stand by the reef topsails. The squall, the squall, jump, my jollies. Jollies? Lord help such jollies. Hush! There goes the jib stay. God, duck lower, Pip. Here comes the royal yard. It's worse than being in the world wood the last day of the year. Who'd go climbing after chestnuts now? But there they go, all cursing, and here I don't. Fine prospects to them. They're on the road to heaven. Hold on hard, Jiminy, what a squall. But those chaps, they are worse yet. They are your white squalls, they. White squalls? White whale? <sighs> here have I heard all their chat just now, and the, and the white whale? <sighs> but spoken of once and only this evening, it makes me jingle all over like my tambourine. That anaconda of an old man swore him in to hunt him. Oh, thou big white god aloft there somewhere in yon darkness, have mercy on this small black boy down here. Preserve him from all men that have no bowels to feel fear. I, Ishmael, was one of that crew. My shouts had gone up with the rest, my oath had been welded with theirs, and stronger I shouted, and more did I hammer and clinch my oath because of the dread in my soul. A wild, mystical, sympathetical feeling was in me. Ahab's quenchless feud seemed mine. With greedy ears, I learned the history of that murderous monster against whom I and all the others had taken our oaths of violence and revenge. For some time past, though at intervals only, the unaccompanied, secluded white whale had haunted those uncivilized seas mostly frequented by the sperm whale fishermen. But not all of them knew of his existence. Only a few of them, comparatively, had knowingly seen him, while the number who as yet had actually and knowingly given battle to him was small indeed. For owing to the large number of whale cruises, the disorderly way they were sprinkled over the entire watery circumference, many of them adventurously pushing their quest along solitary latitudes, so as seldom or never for a whole twelve month or more on a stretch to encounter a single news-telling sail of any sort. The inordinate length of each separate voyage, the irregularity of the times of sailing from home, all these, with other circumstances, direct and indirect, long obstructed the spread through the whole worldwide whaling fleet of the special individualizing tidings concerning Moby Dick. It was hardly to be doubted that several vessels reported to have encountered at such or such a time, or in such or such a meridian, a sperm whale of uncommon magnitude and malignity, which whale, after doing great mischief to his assailants, had completely escaped them. To some minds it was not an unfair presumption, I say, that the whale in question must have been no other than Moby Dick. Yet as of late, the sperm whale fishery had been marked by various and not unfrequent instances of great ferocity, cunning, and malice in the monster attack. Therefore it was that those who by accident ignorantly gave battle to Moby Dick, such hunters, perhaps, for the most part, were content to ascribe the peculiar terror he bred more, as it were, to the perils of the sperm whale fishery at large than to the individual cause. In that way, mostly, the disastrous encounter between Ahab and the whale had hitherto been popularly regarded. And as for those who, previously hearing of the white whale, by chance caught sight of him, in the beginning of the thing, they had every one of them, almost, as boldly and fearlessly lowered for him as for any other whale of that species. But at length, such calamities did ensue in these assaults, not restricted to sprained wrists and ankles, broken limbs, or devouring amputations, but fatal to the last degree of fatality. Those repeated disastrous repulses, all accumulating and piling their terrors upon Moby Dick. Those things had gone far to shake the fortitude of many brave hunters, to whom the story of the white whale had eventually come. Nor did wild rumors of all sorts fail to exaggerate and still the more horrify the true histories of these deadly encounters. For not only do fabulous rumors naturally grow out of the very body of all surprising terrible events, as the smitten tree gives birth to its fungi, but in maritime life, far more than that of terra firma, Wild rumors abound wherever there is any adequate reality for them to cling to. 
And as the sea surpasses the land in this matter, so the whole whale fishery surpasses every other sort of maritime life in the wonderfulness and fearfulness of the rumors which sometimes circulate there. For not only are whalemen as a body unexempt from that ignorance and superstitiousness hereditary to all sailors, but of all sailors they are by all odds the most directly brought into contact with whatever is appallingly astonishing in the sea. Face to face they not only eye its greatest marvels, but hand to jaw give battle to them. Alone in such remotest waters, that though you sail a thousand miles and pass a thousand shores, you would not come to any chiseled hearthstone or aught hospitable beneath that part of the sun. In such latitudes and longitudes, pursuing too such a calling as he does, the whaleman is wrapped by influences all tending to make his fancy pregnant with many a mighty birth. No wonder, then, that ever-gathering volume from the mere transit over the widest watery spaces the outblown rumors of the white whale did in the end incorporate with themselves all manner of morbid hints and half-formed fetal suggestions of supernatural agencies, which eventually invested Moby Dick with new terrors unborrowed from anything that visibly appears. So that in many cases such a panic did he finally strike that few who by those rumors at least had heard of the white whale, few of those hunters were willing to encounter the perils of his jaw. But there were still other and more vital practical influences at work. Not even at the present day has the original prestige of the sperm whale, as fearfully distinguished from all other species of, of the Leviathan, died out in the minds of the whalemen as a body. There are those this day among them who, though intelligent and courageous enough in offering battle to the Greenland or right whale, would perhaps, either from professional inexperience or incompetency or timidity, decline a contest with the sperm whale. At any rate, there were plenty of whalemen, especially among those whaling nations not sailing under the American flag, who have never hostilely encountered the sperm whale, but whose sole knowledge of the Leviathan is restricted to the ignoble monster primitively pursued in the north. Seated on their hatches, these men will hearken with a childish fireside interest with and awe to the wild, strange tales of southern whaling. Nor is the preeminent tremendousness of the great sperm whale anywhere more feelingly comprehended than on board of those prows which stem him. And, and as if the now tested reality of his might had, in former legendary times, thrown its shadow before it, we find some book naturalists, Hollison and Pothelson, declaring the sperm whale not only to be a consternation to every other creature in the sea, but also to be so incredibly ferocious as continually to be a thirst for human blood. Not even down to the so late a time as Cuvier's where these are almost similar impressions he faced. For in his natural history, the Baron himself affirms that at sight of the sperm whale, all fish, sharks included, are, quote, struck with the most lively terrors, end quote, end quote, often in the precipitancy of their flight, dash themselves against the rocks with such violence as to cause instantaneous death, end quote. And however the general experiences of, in the fishery may amend such reports as these, Yet in their full terribleness, even to the bloodthirsty item of Pavelson, the superstitious belief in them is, in some vicissitudes of their vocation, revived in the minds of the hunters. So that overawed by the rumors and portents concerning him, not a few of the fishermen recalled, in references to Moby Dick, the earlier days of the sperm whale fishery, when it was oftentimes hard to induce long-practiced right whalemen to embark in the perils of this new and daring warfare such men protesting that although other leviathans might be hopefully pursued, yet to chase and point land, land at such an apparition as the sperm wheel was not for mortal man, that to attempt it would be inevitably to be torn into a quick eternity. On this head, there are some remarkable documents that may be consulted. Nevertheless, some there were who, even in the face of these things, were ready to give chase to Moby Dick and a still greater number who, chancing only to hear of him distantly and vaguely, without the specific details of any certain calamity, and without superstitious accompaniments, were sufficiently hardy not to flee from the battle it offered, if offered. One of the wild suggestings referred to, as at last coming to be linked with the white whale, in the minds of the superstitiously inclined, was the unearthly conceit that Moby Dick was ubiquitous, that he had actually been encountered in opposite latitudes at one and the same instant of time. Nor, credulous as such minds must have been, 
was this conceit altogether without some faint show of superstitious probability. For as the secrets of the currents in the seas have never yet been divulged, even to the most erudite research, <clears throat> so the hidden waves of the sperm whale, when beneath the surface, remain, in great part unaccountable to his pursuers, and from time to time have originated the most curious and contradictory speculations regarding them especially concerning the mystic modes whereby, after sounding to a great depth, he transports himself with such vast swiftness to the most widely distant points. It is a thing well known to both American and English whale ships, and as well a thing placed upon authoritative record years ago by Scoresby, that some whales have been captured far north in the Pacific in whose bodies have been found the barbs of harpoons darted in the Greenland seas. Nor is it to be gainsaid that in some of these instances it has been declared that the interval of time between the two assaults could not have, been, could not have exceeded very many days. Hence, by inference, it has been believed by some whalemen that the Norwest Passage, so long a problem to man, was never a problem to the whale so that here, in the real living experience of living men, the prodigies related in old times of the inland Strello mountain in Portugal, near whose top there was said to be a lake in which the wrecks of ships floated up to the surface. And that still more powerful story of the Arethusa fountain near Syracuse, whose waters were believed to have come from the Holy Land by an underground passage. These fabulous narrations are almost fully enthralled, equaled by the realities of the whalemen. Forced into familiarity then with such prodigies as these, and knowing that after repeated intrepid assaults, the white whale had escaped alive, it cannot be much matter of surprise that some whalemen should go still further in their superstitions, declaring Moby Dick not only ubiquitous, but immortal for immortality is but ubiquity in time. That though groves of spears should be planted in his flanks, he would still swim away unharmed, or if indeed he should ever be made to spout thick blood. Such a sight would be but a ghastly deception, for again in uninsanguined billows hundreds of leagues away, his unsullied jet would once more be seen. But even stripped of these supernatural surmisings, there was enough in the earthly make an incontestable character of the monster to strike the imagination with unwanted power. For it was not so much his uncommon bulk that so much distinguished him from other sperm whales, but as was elsewhere thrown out a peculiar snow-white wrinkled forehead and a high pyramidical, pyramidical, pyramidical white hump. These were his prominent features, the, the tokens whereby even in the limitless uncharted seas, he revealed his identity at a long distance to those who knew him. The rest of his body was so streaked and spotted and marbled with the same shrouded hue that in the end, he had gained the distinctive appellation of the white whale a name indeed literally justified by his vivid aspect when seen gliding at high noon through a dark blue sea, leaving a Milky Way wake of creamy foam, all spangled with golden gleamings. Nor was it his unwanted magnitude, nor his remarkable hue, nor yet his deformed lower jaw that so much invested the whale with natural terror as that unexampled intelligent malignity which according to specific accounts he had over and over again evinced in his assaults more than all his treacherous retreat retreats struck more of dismay than perhaps aught else for when swimming before his exulting pursuers with every apparent symptom of alarm he had several times been known to turn around suddenly and bearing down upon them, either stave their boats to splinters or drive them back in consternation to their ship. 
Already, several fatalities had attended to his chase. But those similar disasters, however little built bruited ashore, were by no means unusual in the fishery. Yet in most instances, such seemed the white whale's infernal aforethought of ferocity, that every dismembering or death that he caused was not wholly regarded as having been inflicted by an unintelligent agent. Judge, then, to what pitches of inflamed, distracted fury the minds of his more desperate hunters were impelled. When amid the chips of chewed boats and the sinking limbs of torn comrades, they swam out of the white curds of the whale's direful wrath into the serene, exasperating sunlight that smiled on as if at a birth or a bridal. His three boats stove round him and oars and men both whirling in the eddies. One captain seizing the, light, the, not, seizing the line knife from his broken prow had dashed at the whale as an Arkansas duelist at his foe, blindly seeking with a six inch blade to reach the fathom deep life of the whale. That captain was Ahab. And then it was that suddenly sweeping his sickle-shaped lower jaw beneath him, Moby Dick had reaped away Ahab's leg as a mower, a blade of grass in the field. No turban Turk, no hired Venetian or Malay could have smote him with more seeming malice. Small reason was there to doubt then that ever since that almost fatal encounter, Ahab had cherished a wild vindictiveness against the whale. All the more fell for that in his frantic morbidness, he at last came to identify with him not only all his bodily woes, but all his intellectual and spiritual exasperations. The white whale swam before him as the monomaniac incarnation of all those malicious agencies which some deep men feel eating in them till they are left living on with half a heart and half a lung, that intangible malignity which has been from the beginning to those whose dominion, to whose dominion even the modern Christians ascribe one half of the worlds, which the ancient Ophites of the East reverenced in their statue, devil. Ahab did not fall down and worship it like them, but deliriously transferring its idea to the abhorred white whale, he pitied himself, all mutilated against it, all that, all that most maddens and torments, all that stirs up the lees of things, all truth with malice in it, all that cracks the sinews and cakes the brain, all the subtle demonisms of life, and thought, all evil to crazy Ahab were visibly personified and made practically assailable in Moby Dick. He piled upon the whale's white hump the sum of all the general rage and hate felt by his whole race from Adam down. And then, as if his chest had been a mortar, he burst his hot heart's shell upon it. A despeito de tudo, havia sempre alguns que estavam dispostos a conscientemente dar caça a Moby Dick. E um número ainda maior, que apenas, apenas tinha um vago conhecimento dos fatos, sem possuírem pormenores concretos de uma qualquer certa e determinada catástrofe, e sem serem sujeitos a superstições. Era suficientemente ousada para não voltar as costas à luta. Uma das mais fantasiosas superstições a que me referi, relacionada com a baleia branca, era a de que ela tinha o poder da ubiquidade, pois tinha sido encontrada nas duas latitudes ao mesmo tempo. Para os espíritos crédulos, 
Esta ideia não deixava de ter um certo vislumbre de realidade, posto que os segredos das correntes marítimas nunca se deixaram penetrar e nem mesmo cederam às pesquisas mais eruditas. Assim, os caminhos secretos do cachalote quando o submerso continuavam, e grande parte, a ser um enigma para os seus perseguidores, originando de vez em quando as mais curiosas e contraditórias especulações a esse respeito, especialmente no que se refere à forma surpreendente como, depois de mergulhar até uma grande profundidade, o monstro transpõe distâncias consideráveis com uma enorme rapidez. É uma coisa bem conhecida tanto para os baleeiros americanos como ingleses e que também foi autorizadamente relatada há anos por Scoresby, que algumas baleias capturadas no extremo setentrional do Pacífico apresentavam no dorso arpões que lhe tinham sido cravados nos marés da Gron Gronlândia. Nem é de negar o fato de, em alguns desses casos, o intervalo entre dois assaltos ter sido de poucos dias. Daí, inferiram alguns baleeiros que a passagem do noreste, que é há muito um problema para o homem, não constitui problema algum para, o, para a baleia. Aqui, a verdade da vida igual à lenda. Mesmo quando se trata de uma velha história como o da Serra da Estrela em Portugal, onde se diz existir perto do cume um lago em cuja superfície flutuam as carcaças de navios naufragados no oceano, ou na história ainda mais fantástica da fonte de Aratusa, perto de Siracusa, cuja águas proviriam da Terra Santa, canalizadas por uma passagem secreta. Estas narrativas fabulosas são plenamente igualadas pelas realidades cotidianas dos baleeiros. Forçados, pois, a familiarizarem-se com tais prodígios e sabendo que, depois de repetidos e intrépidos assaltos, a baleia branca logrou escapar viva, não deve surpreender muito que em certos baleeiros as superstições se ampliam a ponto de declararem que Moby Dick não só é ubíquo, mas também imortal. A imortalidade nada mais sendo que a ubiquidade referida ao tempo. Que embora se cravem nos seus flancos canteiros de arpões, a baleia se afastará ilesa. E que, mesmo hipótese de alguma vez o seu, o seu jato surgir manchado de sangue, isso não passaria de outra decepção, porque sem léguas, mais adiante, Moby Dick voltaria a lançar para os céus um repuxo límpido e cristalino, como a água que brota numa nascente da montanha. Mas mesmo afastados esses elementos sobrenaturais, ficava ainda bastante matéria sólida com que impressionar poderosamente as imaginações. Era por estas características proeminentes que os marés ilimitados a sua identidade se revelava à distância àqueles que o conheciam. O resto do corpo era de tal forma estreado, mosqueado e marmoreado, com o mesmo tom de sudário que lhe tinha valido, por fim, o apelido de baleia branca. O nome com efeito literalmente justificado por, pelo seu aspecto radiante quando se avistava a deslizar em pleno meio-dia no meio do mar azul ferrente, deixando uma esteira de um branco leitoso onde cintilavam palhetas de ouro. E não era a sua extraordinária envergadura, nem a sua cor notável, nem mesmo a sua mandíbula inferior disforme que a tornavam terrível. 
o terror provinha da nunca antes observada e inteligente malignidade que, segundo relatos concretos, o monstro tinha evidenciado nos seus ataques. Mais do que tudo, eram temidas as suas traiçoeiras retiradas e sabido que várias vezes, ao fugir diante dos seus perseguidores e jultantes, dando todos os sintomas do terror da morte, se voltou bruscamente para contra-atar, desfazendo as baleeiras em mil pedaços e obrigando os homens a fugir consternados para o bordo no navio base. Já alguns desastres fatais tinham ocorrido, mas sucedem muitos acidentes semelhantes nas pescarias e pouco se fala deles. Nestes casos particulares, a feroz e infernal premeditação de Moby Dick era de tal ordem que cada mutilação ou morte que causava não era inteiramente considerada, considerada como obra de agente em inteligência. Imaginem agora a que pináculos de inflamado e desordenado furor se erguiam às mentes dos seus mais desesperados perseguidores, quando, no meio dos fragmentos dos escaleres triturados e dos membros despedaçados dos companheiros tinham de nadar para fora do leite coalhado da colera da baleia sobre um sol sereno e exasperante que continuava a sorrir como se estivesse a iluminar um nascimento ou umas núpcias. As suas três baleeiras afundadas à vista dele, homens e remos rudupiando na ressaca um capitão, arrancando uma faca de cortar linhas da proa ferida de morte, lançou-se sobre o, a baleia como um duelista do Arkansas contra o seu ad adversário, procurando cegamente com a sua lâmina dos seis polegadas atingir a profunda fonte da vida da baleia. Esse capitão era Ahab. E foi então que, passando bruscamente por debaixo dele a sua mandíbula inferior em forma de foice, Moby Dick cortou a perna de Ahab com a mesma facilidade com, com que uma tesoura corta um ziano ou malaio, poderia feri-lo com maior maldade. Era, portanto, fácil de compreender por que motivo Ahab, depois deste encontro quase mortal, nutria um ódio furioso contra aquela baleia. O mais terrível, porém, era que na sua frenética loucura acabar por identificá-la não só com todos os seus sofrimentos físicos, mas também até com os seus sofrimentos morais. A baleia branca nadava diante dele com a encarnação monomaníaca de todos aqueles agentes maliciosos que alguns homens sentem a corroê-los até que não lhes resta para viver senão metade de um pulmão e metade do coração. A baleia branca nadava diante dele com a encarnação monomaníaca de todos aqueles agentes maliciosos que alguns homens sentem a corroê-los até que não lhes resta para viver senão metade de um pulmão e metade do coração. Essa inatingível e remota malignidade a cujo poder até os modernos cristãos atribuem o domínio de metade do mundo e que os antigos ofitas do Oriente reverenciavam as suas imagens demónicas, Ahab não se prosternava para adorá-la mas na sua loucura encarnava-a na baleia branca tão detestada e, mesmo mutilado, lançava-se contra ela. Tudo o que enlouqueceu, o que contendo, tudo o que enlouquece, o que contendo uma dose malícia, tudo o que desorganiza os nervos e confunde o cérebro, tudo 
o que existe de demoníaco na vida e no pensamento, todo o mal, em suma, encontrava-se praticamente susceptível de ser enfrentado em Moby Dick. A Rab empilhara sobre a bossa branca da baleia a soma de cólera e de furor sentidos por toda a humanidade a partir de Adão, e como se o seu peito fosse o morteiro, fazia deflagrar lá dentro a granada do seu coração ardente. It is not probable that this monomania in him took its instant rise at the precise time of his bodily dismemberment. Then, in darting at the monster, knife in hand, he had but given loose to a sudden, passionate, corporal animosity. And when he received the stroke that tore him, he probably but felt the agonizing bodily laceration, but nothing more. Yet, when by this collision forced to turn home, and for long months of days and weeks, Ahab and Anguish lay stretched together in one hammock, rounding in midwinter that dreary, howling Patagonian cape. Then it was that his torn body and gashed soul bled into one another, and so interfusing made him mad. Then, it was only then, on the homeward voyage after the encounter, that the final monomania seized him. Seems all but certain from the fact that, at intervals during the passage, he was a raving lunatic, And though unlimbed of a leg, yet such vital strength yet lurked in his Egyptian chest, and was moreover intensified by his delirium, that his mates were forced to lace him fast, even there, as he sailed, raving in his hammock. In a straitjacket, he swung to the mad rockings of the gales, and when running into more sufferable latitudes, the ship, with mild stuns sails spread, floated across the tranquil tropics, and, to all appearances, the old man's delirium seemed left behind him with the Cape Horn swells, and he came forth from his dark den into the blessed light and air. Even then, when he bore that firm collected front, however pale, and issued his calm orders once again, and his mates thanked God the direful madness was now gone, even then Ahab, in his hidden self, raved on. Human madness is oftentimes a cunning and most feline thing. When you think it fled, it may have but become transfigured into some still subtler form. Ahab's full lunacy subsided not, but deepeningly contracted, like the unabated Hudson, when that noble Northman flows narrowly but unfathomably through the Highland Gorge. But, as in his narrow flowing monomania, not one jot of Ahab's broad madness had been left behind. So in that broad madness, not one jot of his great natural intellect had perished. That before living agent now became the living instrument. If such a furious trope may stand, his special lunacy stormed his general sanity and carried it and turned all its concentrated cannon upon its own mad mark, so that far from having lost its strength, Ahab, to that one end, did now possess a thousandfold more potency than ever he had sanely brought to bear upon any one reasonable object. This is much, yet Ahab's larger, darker, deeper part remains unhinted. But vain to popularize profundities, and all truth is profound. Winding far down from within the very heart of this spiked Hotel de Cluny, where we here stand, however grand and wonderful, now quit it and take your way, ye nobler, sadder souls, to those vast Roman halls of Thermes, where, far beneath the fantastic tower of man's upper earth, his root of grandeur, His whole awful essence sits in bearded state, an antique buried beneath antiquities, and throned on torsos. So with a broken throne, the great gods mock that captive king. So like a caryatid, he patient sits, upholding on his frozen brow the piled entablatures of age. 
Wind ye down there, ye prouder, sadder souls. Question that proud, sad king. A family likeness. I, he did beget ye, ye young, exiled royalties. And from your grim sire only will the old state secret come. Now in his heart, Ahab had some glimpse of this, namely, all my means are sane, my motive and my object mad. Yet without power to kill or change or shun the fact, he likewise knew that to mankind he did now long dissemble, in some sort did still. But that thing of his dissembling was only subject to his perceptibility, not to his will determinate. Nevertheless, so well did he succeed in that dissembling, that when with ivory leg he stepped ashore at last, no Nantucketer thought him otherwise than but naturally grieved, and that to the quick with the terrible casualty with which had overtaken him. The report of his undeniable delirium at sea was likewise popularly ascribed to a kindred cause, and so too all the added moodiness which always afterwards to the very day of sailing in the Pequod on the present voyage sat brooding on his brow. Nor is it so very unlikely that far from distrusting his fitness for another whaling voyage on account of such dark symptoms, the calculating people of that prudent isle were inclined to harbor the conceit that for those very reasons he was all the better qualified and set on edge for a pursuit so full of rage and wildness as the bloody hunt of whales. Gnawed within and scorched without with the infixed, unrelenting fangs of some incurable idea, such a one could he be found would he seem the very man to dart his iron and lift his lance against the most appalling of all brutes. Or, if for any reason thought to be corporally incapacitated for that, yet such an one would seem superlatively competent to cheer and howl on his underlings for the attack. But be all this as it may, certain it is, that with the mad secret of his unabated rage bolted up and keyed in him, Ahab had purposefully sailed upon the present voyage with the one only and all engrossing object of hunting the white whale. Had any one of his old acquaintances on shore but half dreamed of what was lurking in him, how soon would their aghast and righteous souls have wrenched the ship from such a fiendish man? They were bent on profitable cruises, the profit to be counted down in dollars from the mint. He was intent on an audacious, immitigable, and supernatural revenge. Here then was this gray-headed, ungodly old man chasing with curses a Job's whale around the world at the head of a crew, too, chiefly made up of mongrel renegades and castaways and cannibals, morally enfeebled also by the incompetence of mere unaided virtue or right-mindedness in Starbuck, the invulnerable jollity of indifference and recklessness in Stubb, and the pervading mediocrity in Flask. Such a crew, so officered, seemed specially picked and packed by some infernal fatality to help him to his monomaniac revenge. How it was that they thought so aboundingly responded to the old man's ire, by what evil magic their souls were possessed, that at times his hate seemed almost theirs. The white whale as much their insufferable foe as his, how all this came to be, what the white whale was to them or how their unconscious understandings also in some dim, unsuspected way, he might have seemed the gliding great demon of the seas of life. All this to explain would be to dive deeper than Ishmael can go. The subterranean miner that works in us all, how can one tell whither leads his shaft by the ever-shifting muffled sound of his pick? Who does not feel the irresistible arm drag? What skiff in tow of a 74 can stand still? For one, I gave myself up to the abandonment of the time and the place, but while yet 
all a rush to encounter the whale could see naught in that brute but the deadliest ill. What the white whale was to Ahab had been hinted, what at times he was to me, as yet remains unsaid. Aside from those more obvious considerations touching Moby Dick, which could not but occasionally awaken in any man's soul some alarm, there was another thought, or rather vague, nameless horror concerning him, which at times, by its intensity, completely overpowered all the rest. And yet so mystical and well-nigh ineffable was it that I almost despair of putting it in a comprehensible form. It was the whiteness of the whale that above all things appalled me. But how can I hope to explain myself here, and yet in some dim, random way explain myself I must, else all these chapters might be naught. Though in many natural objects, whiteness refiningly enhances beauty as if imparting some special virtue of its own, as in marbles, japonicas, pearls, and though various nations have in some way recognized a certain royal preeminence in this hue, even the barbaric grand old kings of Pigu, placing the title Lord of the White Elephants above all other magniloquent ascriptions of dominion, and the modern kings of Siam unfurling the same snow-white quadruped in the royal standard, and the Hanoverian flag bearing one figure of a snow-white charger, and the great Auster Austrian Empire, Caesarian hair, heir to overlording Rome, having for the imperial color of the same imperial hue, and though this preeminence in it applies to the human race itself, giving the white man ideal mastership over every dusky tribe, and though, besides all this, whiteness has been even made significant of gladness. For among the Romans, a white stone marked a joyful day, and though in other mortal sympathies and symbolizing, symbolizings, the same hue is made the emblem of many touching noble things. The innocence of brides, the benignity of age, though among the red men of America, the giving of the white belt of the wampum was the deepest pledge of honor, though in many climes, whiteness typifies the majest majesty of justice in the ermine of the judge and contributes to the daily state of kings and queens drawn by milk white steeds. Though even in the higher mysteries of the most august religions, it has been made the symbol of the divine spotlessness and power by the Persian fire worshipers. The white forked flame being held the holiest on the altar and in the Greek mythologies, great Jove himself being made incarnate in a snow white bull and though to the noble Iroquois, the midwinter sacrifice of the sacred white dog was by far the holiest festival of their theology. That spotless, faithful creature being held to the purest envoy could send to the, the, to the great spirit with the annual tidings of their own fidelity. And though directly from the Latin word for white, all Christian priests derive the name of one part of their sacred vesture, the alb or tunic, worn beneath the cassock, and though among the holy pomps of the Romish faith, white is specially employed in the celebration of the Passion of our Lord. Though in the vision of St. John, white robes are given to the redeemed, and the four and twenty elders stand clothed in white before the great white throne, and the holy one that sitteth there, white like wool, yet for all these accumulated associations, which whatever is sweet and honorable and sublime, there yet lurks an elusive something in the innermost idea of this hue, which strikes more panic to the soul than the redness which affrights in blood. This elusive quality it is which causes the thought of whiteness when divorced from more kindly associations and coupled with any object terrible in itself to heighten that terror to the furthest bounds. Whiteness, the white bear of the poles, white shark of the tropics, what but their smooth, flaky whiteness makes them the translucent horrors they are. That ghastly whiteness which, it, which imparts such an abhorrent mildness, even more loathsome than terrific to the dumb gloating of their aspect, so that not fierce fanged tiger in his heraldic coat can so stagger courage as the white shrouded bear or shark 
With reference to the polar bear, it may possibly be urged by him, who would fain go still deeper in this matter, that it is not the whiteness, separately regarded, which heightens the intolerable hideousness, hideousness of that brute. For analyzed and heightened hideousness might be said that only rises from the circumstance, that the irresponsible ferociousness of the creature stands invested in the fleece of celestial innocence and love, and hence, by bringing together two such opposite emotions in our minds, the polar bear frightens us so unnatural a contrast, but even assuming all this to be true, yet were it not for the whiteness, you would not have an intensified terror. As for the white shark, the white gliding ghostlessness, ghostliness of repose in that creature, what beheld in his ordinary moods, strangely tallies with the same quality, the polar quadruped. <clears throat> Peculiarity is the most vividly hit by the French in the name they bestow upon that fish. The Ramish Mass for the dead begins with the Requiem Eternum, Eternal Rest. Whence Requiem, denoting the Mass itself and any other funeral music, now in illusion the white silent stillness of death in this shark and the mild deadliness of his habits, the French call him Wiquin. Bethink of the albatross whence from those clouds of spiritual wonderment and pale dread in which that white phantom sails in all imaginations not Coleridge first through that spell but God's great unflattering laureate nature I remember the first albatross I ever saw it was during a prolonged gale in waters hard upon the Antarctic seas from my forenoon watch below I ascended to the overclouded deck and there dashed upon the main hatches I saw a regal feathering thing of unspotted whiteness, and with a hooked Roman bill sublime. All intervals it arched forth its vast archangel wings as if to embrace some holy ark. Wondrous flutterings and throbbings shook it. Though bodily unharmed, it uttered cries as if some king's ghost in supernatural distress. Though its inexpressible strange eyes, methought, I peeped the two secrets which took gold took hold of God. As Abraham before the angels, I bowed myself. The white thing was so white, its wings so wide, and in those forever exiled waters, I had lost the miserable warping memories of traditions and towns. Long I gazed at that prodigy of plumage. I cannot tell, can only hint the things that darted through me then. But at last I awoke, and turning, asked a sailor, what bird is this? A goni, he replied. Goni? Never had heard that name before. Is it conceivable that this glorious thing, utterly unknown to men ashore, never? But some time after I learned that goni was some seaman's name for albatross, so that by no possibility could Coleridge's wild rhyme had, taught, had aught to do with those mystical impressions which were mine. When I saw that bird upon our deck, for, ne for neither I had then read rhyme nor knew the bird to be an albatross. Yet in saying this, I do indirectly burnish a little brighter the noble merit of the poem and the poet. But how had the mystic thing been caught? Whisper it not, and I will tell, with a treacherous hook and line, as the fowl floated on the sea. At last, the captain had made a postman of it, tying a lettered leather, leathern tally around his neck, with the ship's time and place, and then letting it escape. But I doubt not that leathern tally meant for man was taken off in heaven when the white fowl flew to join the wing folding, the invoking, and adoring cherubim. Most famous in our Western annals and Indian traditions is that of the white steed of the prairies, a magnificent milk-white charger, large-eyed, small-headed, bluff-chested, and with the dignity of a thousand monarchs in his lofty, overscorning carriage. He was the elected Xerxes of vast herds of wild horses, whose pastures in those days were only fenced by the Rocky Mountains and the Alleghenies. At their flaming head, he westward trooped it like that chosen star, which every evening leads on the hosts of light. The flashing cascade of his mane, the curving comet of his tail, invested him with housings more resplendent than gold and silver beaters could have furnished him. A most imperial and archangelical apparition of that unfallen Western world, 
which to the eyes of the old trappers and hunters revived the glories of those primeval times when Adam walked majestic as a god, bluff bowed and fearless as this mighty steed. Whether marching amid his aides and marshals in the van of countless cohorts that endlessly streamed it over the plains like an Ohio, or whether with his circumambient subjects browsing all around at the horizon, the white steed gallopingly reviewed them with warm nostrils reddening through his cool milkiness. In whatever aspect he presented himself, always to the bravest Indians, he was the object of trembling reverence and awe. Nor can it be questioned from what stands on legendary record of this noble horse that it was his spiritual whiteness chiefly which so clothed him with divineness and that this divineness had that in it which, though commanding worship, at the same time enforced a certain nameless terror. But there are other instances where this whiteness loses all that accessory and strange glory which invests it in the white steed and albatross. What is it that in the albino man so peculiarly repels and often shocks the eye as that sometimes he is loathed by his own kith and kin? It is that whiteness which invests him, a thing expressed by the name he bears. The albino is as well made as other men, has no substantive deformity, and yet this mere aspect of all-pervading whiteness makes him more strangely hideous than the ugliest abortion. Why should this be so? Nor, in quite other aspects, does nature in her least palpable but not the less malicious agencies fail to enlist among her forces this crowning attribute of the terrible. From its snowy aspect, the gauntleted ghost of the southern seas has been denominated the white squall. Nor, in some historic instances, has the art of human malice omitted so potent an auxiliary. How wild, wildly it heightens the effect of that passage in Foissar, when, masked in the snowy symbol of their faction, the desperate white hoods of Ghent murder their bailiff in the marketplace. Nor, in some things, does the common hereditary experience of all mankind fail to bear witness to the supernaturalism of this hue. It cannot well be doubted that the one visible quality in the aspect of the dead which most appalls the gazer is the marble pallor lingering there, as if indeed that pallor were as much like the badge of consternation in the other world as of mortal trepidation here. And from that pallor of the dead, we borrow the expressive hue of the shroud in which we wrap them. Nor even in our superstitions do we fail to throw the same snowy mantle round our phantoms, all ghosts rising in a milk-white fog. Yea, while these terrors seize us, let us add that even the king of terrors, when personified by the evangelist, rides on his pallid horse. Therefore, in his other moods, symbolize whatever grand or gracious thing he will by whiteness, no man can deny that in its profoundest idealized significance, it calls up a peculiar apparition to the soul. But though without dissent this point be fixed, how is mortal man to account for it? To analyze it would seem impossible. Can we then, by the citation of some of those instances wherein this thing of whiteness, though for the time either wholly or in great part stripped of all direct associations calculated to impart to it aught fearful, but nevertheless is found to exert over us the same sorcery, however modified, can we thus hope to light upon some chance clue to conduct us to the hidden cause we seek? Let us try. But in a matter like this, Subtlety appeals to subtlety, and without imagination, no man can follow another into these halls. And though, doubtless, some at least of the imaginative impressions about to be presented may have been shared by most men, yet few perhaps were entirely conscious of them at the time, and therefore may not be able to recall them now. Why, to the man of untutored ideality, who happens to be but loosely acquainted with the peculiar character of the day, 
does the bare mention of Whitsuntide marshal in the fancy such long, dreary, speechless processions of slow-pacing pilgrims, downcast and hooded with new-fallen snow? Or to the unread, unsophisticated Protestant of the Middle American states, why does the passing mention of a white friar or a white nun evoke such an eyeless statue in the soul? Or what is there apart from the traditions of dungeon warriors and kings, which will not wholly account for it, that makes the White Tower of London tell so much more strongly on the imagination of an untraveled American than those other storied structures, its neighbors, the Byward Tower, or even the Bloody. And those sublimer towers, the White Mountains of New Hampshire, Whence, in peculiar moods, comes that gigantic ghostliness over the soul at the bare mention of that name, while the thought of Virginia's Blue Ridge is full of a soft, dewy, distant dreaminess? Or why, irrespective of all latitudes and longitudes, does the name of the White Sea exert such a spectralness over the fancy, while that of the Yellow Sea lulls us with mortal thoughts of long, lacquered, mild afternoons on the waves, followed by the gaudiest and yet sleepiest of sunsets? Or, to choose a wholly unsubstantial instance, purely addressed to the fancy, why, in reading the old fairy tales of Central Europe, does the tall, pale man of the heart's forests, whose changeless pallor unrestingly glides through the green of the groves, why is this phantom more terrible than all the whooping imps of the Bloxburg? Nor is it altogether the remembrance of her cathedral toppling earthquakes, nor the stampedos of her frantic seas, nor the tearlessness of arid skies that never rain, nor the sight of her wide field of leaning spires, wrenched copestones, and crosses all a-droop like canted yards of anchored fleets, and her suburban avenues of house walls lying over upon each other as a tossed pack of cards. It is not these things alone which make tearless Lima the strangest, saddest city thou canst see. For Lima has taken the white veil, and there is a higher horror in this whiteness of her woe. Old as Pizarro, this whiteness keeps her ruins forever new, admits not the cheerful greenness of complete decay, spreads over her broken ramparts the rigid pallor of an apoplexy that fixes its own distortions. I know that, to the common apprehension, this phenomenon of whiteness is not confessed to be the prime agent in exaggerating the terror of objects otherwise terrible. Nor to the unimaginative mind is there aught of terror in those appearances whose awfulness to another mind almost solely consists in this one phenomenon, especially when exhibited under any form at all approaching to muteness or universality. What I mean by these two statements may perhaps be respectively elucidated by the following examples. First, the mariner. When drawing nigh the coasts of foreign lands, if by night he hear the roar of breakers, starts to vigilance, and feels just enough of trepidation to sharpen all his faculties. But under precisely similar circumstances, let him be called from his hammock to view his ship sailing from a midnight sea of milky whiteness, as if from encircling headlands shoals of combed white bears were swimming round him. Then he feels a silent superstitious dread. The shrouded phantom of the whitened waters is horrible to him as a real ghost. In vain, the lead assures him he is still off soundings. Heart and helm, they both go down. He never rests till blue water is under him again. Yet where is the mariner who will tell thee? Sir, it is not so much the fear of striking hidden rocks as the fear of that hideous whiteness that so stirred me. Second, to the native Indian of Peru, the continual sight of the snow hood at Andes conveys not a dread, except perhaps in the mere fancying of the eternal frosted desolateness reigning at such vast altitudes and the natural conceit of what a fear fearfulness it would be to lose oneself in such inhuman solitudes. Much the same it is to the backwoodsman of the West, who, with comparative indifference, views an unbounded prairie sheeted with driven snow 
no shadow of tree or twig to break the fixed trance of whiteness. Not so the sailor, beholding the scenery of the Antarctic seas, where at times, by some infernal trick of ledger domain and the powers of frost and air, he, shivering and half shipwrecked, instead of rainbows speaking hope and solace to his misery, views what seems a boundless churchyard grinning upon him with its lean ice monuments and splintered crosses. But thou sayest, methinks this whitely chapter about whiteness is but a white flag hung out from a craven soul. Thou surrenderest to a hypo, Ishmael. Tell me why this strong young colt folds in some peaceful valley of Vermont, far removed from all the beasts of prey, why is it that upon the sunniest day, if you but shake a fresh buffalo robe behind him, so that he cannot even see it, but only smells its wild animal muskiness? Why will he start, snort, and with bursting eyes paw the ground in frenzies of affright? There is no remembrance in him of gorings of wild creatures in his green northern home, so that the strange muskiness he smells cannot recall to him anything associated with the experience of former perils. For what knows he this New England cult of the black bisons of distant Oregon. No, but here thou beholdest, even in a dumb brute, the instinct of the knowledge of the demonism in this world. Though thousands of miles from Oregon, still when he smells that savage musk, the rending, goring bison herds are as present as the deserted wild foal of the prairies, which this instant they may be trampling into dust. Thus then the muffled rollings of the milky sea, the bleak rustlings of the festooned frosts of mountains, the desolate shiftings of the windrowed snows of prairies, all these to Ishmael are as the shaking of that buffalo robe to the frightened colt. Though neither knows where lie the nameless things of which the mystic signs give forth such hints, yet with me, as with the colt, somewhere those things must exist. Though in many of its aspects this visible world seems formed in love, the invisible spheres were formed in fright. Not yet have we solved the incantation of this whiteness and learned why it appeals with such power to the soul and more strange and far more pretentious why, as we have seen, it is at once the most meaning symbol of spiritual things, nay, the very veil of the Christian's deity and yet should be as it is the intensifying agent in things the most appalling to mankind. Is it that by its indefiniteness, it shadows forth the heartless voids and immensities of the universe and thus stabs us from behind with the thought of annihilation when beholding the white depths of the Milky Way? Or is it that isn't that as in essence, whiteness is not so much a color as a visible absence of color and at the same time, the concrete of all colors? Is it that these reasons that there's a, such a dumb blankness full of meaning in a wide landscape of snows, a colorless, all color of atheism from which we shrink? And when we consider that other theory of the natural philosophers, that all other earthly hues, every stately or lovely emblazoning, the sweet tinges of sunset skies and woods, yea, the gilded velvets of butterflies and the butterfly cheeks of young girls, all these are but subtle deceits not actually inherent in substances, but only laid on from without. So that all deified nature absolutely paints like the harlot, whose allurements cover nothing but the charnel house within. And when we proceed further and consider that the mystical cosmetic, which produces every one of her hues, the great principle of light, forever remains white or colorless in itself, and if operating without medium upon matter, would touch all things, even tulips and roses, with its own blank tinge. Pondering all this, the palsy universe lies before us like a leper, and like willful travelers in Lapland who refuse to wear colored and coloring glasses upon their eyes. So the wretched infidel gazes himself blind at the monumental white shroud that wraps all prospect around him. And of all these things, the albino whale was the symbol. Wonder ye then at the fiery hunt? E. De matroos die de kusten van vreemde landen nadert en s'nachts het brullen van de branding hoort, schrikt op uit zijn slaap en voelt net genoeg opwinding om al zijn zintuigen te scherpen. Maar roep hem onder precies dezelfde omstandigheden uit zijn kooi aan dek 
om te zien hoe zijn schip vaart door een middernachtelijke melkwitte zee, alsof scholen gekamde witte beren uit de omringende hooglanden om hem heen zwommen, dan ondergaat hij een stille, bijgelovige vrees. De in lijkwa gehulde spookgedaante van het wit aandoende water schrikt hem af als een echte geest. Vergeefs verzekert het dieploot hem dat hij nog geen grond aanloopt. Moed en helmstok gaan beide neerwaarts. Hij rust niet voor er weer blauw water onder hem is. En toch, waar is de zeeman die ooit tegen je zal zeggen... Meneer, het was niet zozeer de angst om op verborgen rotsen te lopen, als wel de angst voor dat afzichtelijke wit wat me overstuur maakte. 2. Voor de Indiaanse inboorling in Peru heeft de voortdurende aanblik van de met sneeuw gezadelde Andes niets vreeswekkends, behalve misschien wanneer hij zich voorstelt hoe op die enorme hoogten de eeuwige, bevroren onherbergzaamheid heerst en vanzelf beseft hoe vreselijk het zou zijn om in zulke onmenselijke verlatenheden te verdwalen. Het komt sterk overeen met de woudbewoner in het Wilde Westen, die betrekkelijk gelijkmoedig kijkt naar een onbegrensde prairie, bedekt met jachtsneeuw, zonder schaduw van boom of tak, die de starre, witte betovering verbreekt. Anders vergaat het de zeeman, die het Zuidpoollandschap aanschouwt, waar hij soms door een helse goocheltruc in de greep van vorst en lucht, huiverend en op een halve gaan schip, in plaats van regenbogen die spreken van hoop en troost in zijn misère, iets ziet als een eindeloos kerkhof dat hem toegrijnst met zijn scheve ijsmonumenten en versplinterde kruisen. Maar, zult ge zeggen, dit loodwitte hoofdstuk over witheid is me dunkt niet meer dan een witte vlag die hangt uit een lafhartige ziel. Gelaat u kennen, Ismaël. Vertel mij dan eens waarom een jong, sterk veulen, geworpen in een vredig dal in Vermont, ver van alle roofdieren, waarom dat op de zonnigste dag als je maar een verse buffelhuid achter hem beweegt, zodat hij hem niet eens kan zien, maar alleen de wilde dierlijke muskus scheur uit, waarom het dan opspringt, snuift en met uitpuilende ogen in paniek de grond openkrapt. Het heeft in zijn groene noordelijke thuisland geen herinnering aan enig hoorn gespiets van wilde dieren. Dus de vreemde muskus die hij ruikt kan niets in hem oproepen dat verband houdt met de ervaring van eerdere gevaren. Wat weet het veulen in New England immers van de zwarte bisons in het verre Oregon? Nee, maar hier aanschouw je zelfs in een redeloos dier de instinctieve kennis van het demonische in de wereld. Al is het duizenden mijlen van Oregon... Toch zijn, wanneer het die wilde muskus ruikt, de verscheurende, spietsende bizonkuddes net zo aanwezig als voor het verlaten wilde veulen van de prairies dat daar op dit moment misschien tot stop wordt vertrapt. Zo is het ook met de gesmoorde golfslag van een melkwitte zee, het akelige geritsel van ijslingers in de bergen, het desolate schuiven van de door de wind gerimpelde sneeuw in de prairies. Dit alles is voor Ismaël als het schudden met die buffelhuid voor het verschrikte veulen. Al weet geen van ons tweeën waar zich de naamloze dingen bevinden waarna dit raadselachtige teken verwijst, toch moeten ze voor mij, net als voor het veulen, ergens bestaan. Al lijkt deze zichtbare wereld in veel opzichten in liefde geschapen, de onzichtbare sferen zijn geschapen in vrees. Maar we hebben de magische betovering van die witte nog niet verklaard of ontdekt waarom het zo appelleert aan de ziel en vreemde en veel onheilspellende waarom het, zoals we hebben gezien, tegelijk het veelzeggendste symbool van het spirituele is. Ja, de sluier zelfs van de christelijke godsidee en de versterkende factor bij zaken die de mensheid het meest doen verbleken. Komt het doordat in zijn onbepaaldheid de harteloze leegte en onmetelijkheden van het heelal vooraf schaduwt en ons met de gedachte aan te niet gaan in de rug steekt wanneer wij de witte diepten van de melkweg zien? Of komt het doordat wit in wezen niet zozeer een kleur is als wel de zichtbare afwezigheid van kleur en tevens de som van alle kleuren? Komt het daardoor dat er zo'n doffe, maar betekenisvolle wezenloosheid schuilt 
in een wijd sneeuwlandschap. Een kleurloze, alkleurige godlogening waarvoor wij terugdeinzen. En wanneer we de theorie van de natuurfilosofen beschouwen dat alle andere aardse kleuren, alle luisterrijke of lieflijke verheerlijking, de zoete tinten van luchten en bossen bij zonsondergang, ja, en het gouden fluweel van vlinders en de vlinderdonzige wangen van jonge meisjes, dat dat allemaal maar subtiel bedrog is. Niet echt eigen aan dingen, maar alleen van buitenaf opgelegd, zodat de hele vergoddelijkte natuur zich in feite verft als een hoer, wie bekoringen alleen haar inwendige knekelhuis verbergen. En wanneer we verder gaan en bedenken dat de heimelijke cosmetica, waaraan zij die kleuren stuk voor stuk dankt, te weten het grote lichtbeginsel, in zichzelf eeuwig wit of kleurloos blijft. En als het zonder make-up op de materie zou inwerken, alles, zelfs tulpen en rozen, zou aanraken met zijn eigen wezenloze tint. Wanneer wij dit allemaal overwegen... Chapter 43 Hark! Hist! Did you hear that noise, Kabako? It was the middle watch, a fair moonlight. The seamen were standing in a cordon, extending from one of the freshwater butts in the waist to the scuttlebutt near the taffrail. In this manner, they passed the buckets to fill the scuttlebutt, standing for the most part on the hallowed precincts of the quarter deck. They were careful not to speak or rustle their feet. From hand to hand, the buckets went in the deepest silence, only broken by the occasional flap of a sail and the steady hum of the unceasingly advancing keel. It was in the midst of this repose that Archie, one of the cordon whose post was near the after hatches, whispered to his neighbor, a colo, the words above. Hiss, did you hear that noise, Kabako? Take the bucket, will ye, Archie? What noise do you mean? There it is again, under the hatches. Don't you hear it? A cough. It sounded like a cough. Cough be damned. Pass along that return bucket. There, again, there it is. It sounds like two or three sleepers turning over now. Caramba, have done, shipmate, will ye? It's the three soaked biscuits ye ate for supper turning over inside of ye. Nothing else. Look to the bucket. Say what ye will, shipmate. I've sharp ears. Aye, you are the chap, ain't ye, that heard the hum of the old Quakeress's knitting needles fifty miles at sea from Nantucket. You're the chap. Grin away. We'll see what turns up. Hark ye, Kabako. There is somebody down in the afterhold that has not yet been seen on deck. And I suspect our old mogul knows something of it, too. I heard Stubb tell Flask one morning watch that there was something of that sort in the wind. Tish! The bucket! Chapter 44 The Chart Had you followed Captain Ahab down into his cabin after the squall that took place on the night succeeding that wild ratification of his purpose with his crew, you would have seen him go to a locker in the transom and bringing out a large wrinkled roll of yellowish sea charts, spread them before him on his screwed down table. Then seating himself before it, you would have seen him intently study the various lines and shadings which there met his eye and with slow but steady pencil, trace additional courses over spaces that before were blank. At intervals, he would refer to piles of old log books beside him, wherein were set down the seasons and the places in which, on various former voyages of various ships, sperm whales had been captured or seen. While thus employed, the heavy pewter lamp suspended in chains over his head continually rocked with the motion of the ship and forever threw shifting gleams and shadows of lines upon his wrinkled brow, till it almost seemed that, while he himself was marking out lines and courses on the wrinkled charts, some invisible pencil was also tracing lines and courses upon the deeply marked chart of his forehead. But it was not this night in particular that, 
In the solitude of his cabin, Ahab thus pondered over his charts. Almost every night they were brought out. Almost every night some pencil marks were effaced and others were substituted. For with the charts of all four oceans before him, Ahab was threading a maze of currents and eddies with a view to the more certain accomplishment of that monomaniac thought of his soul. Now, to anyone not fully acquainted with the ways of the Leviathans, might seem an absurdly hopeless task thus to seek out one solitary creature in the unhooped oceans of this planet. But not so did it seem to Ahab, who knew the sets of all tides and currents, and thereby calculating the driftings of the sperm whale's food, and also calling to mind the regular ascertained seasons for hunting him in particular latitudes, could arrive at reasonable surmises, almost approaching to certainties, concerning the timeliest day to be upon this or that ground in search of his prey. So assured indeed is the fact concerning the periodicalness of the sperm whales resorting to given waters, that many hunters believe that, could he be closely observed and studied throughout the world, were the logs for one voyage of the entire whale fleet carefully collated, then the migrations of the sperm whale would be found to correspond in invariability to those of the herring shoals or the flights of swallows. On this hint, attempts have been made to construct elaborate migratory charts of the sperm whale. Footnote. Since the above was written, the statement is happily borne out by an official circular issued by Lieutenant Morey of the National Observatory, Washington, April 16, 1851. By that circular, it appears precisely such a chart is in course of completion, and portions of it are presented in the circular. This chart divides the, quote, this chart divides the ocean into districts of five degrees of latitude by five degrees of longitude, perpendicularly through each of which districts are twelve columns for the twelve months, and horizontally through each of which districts are three lines, one to show the number of days that have been spent in each month in every district, and two others to show the numbers of days in which whales, sperm or right, have been seen. Besides, when making a passage from one feeding ground to another, the sperm whales, guided by some infallible instinct, save wrath or secret intelligence from the deity, mostly swim in veins, as they are called, continuing their way along a given ocean line with such undeviating exactitude that no ship ever sailed her course by any chart with one tithe of such marvelous precision. Though, in these cases, the direction taken by any one whale be as straight as a surveyor's parallel, and though the line of advance be strictly confined to its own unavoidable straight wake, yet the arbitrary vein in which at these times he is said to swim generally embraces some few miles in width more or less, as the vein is presumed to expand or contract, but never exceeds the visual sweep from the whale ship's mastheads when circumspectly gliding along this magic zone. The sum is that at particular seasons within the, that breadth and along that path, migrating whales may with great confidence be looked for, and hence not only at substantiated times upon well-known separate feeding grounds could Ahab hope to encounter his prey, but in crossing the widest expanses of water between those grounds, he could, by his art, so place and time himself on his way as even then not to be wholly without prospect of a meeting. There was a circumstance which at first sight seemed to entangle his delirious but still methodical scheme, but not so in the reality, perhaps. Though the gregarious sperm whales have their regular seasons for particular grounds, yet in general you cannot conclude that the herds which haunted such and such a latitude or longitude this year, say, will turn out to be identically the same with those that were found there the preceding season. Though there are peculiar and unquestionable instances where the contrary of this has proved true. In general, the same remark, only within a less wide limit, applies to the solitaries and hermits among the matured aged sperm whales. So that though Moby Dick had in former year been seen, for example, on what is called the Seychelles ground in the Indian Ocean or, or Volcano Bay on the Japanese coast, yet it did not follow that were the Pequod to visit either of those spots in any subsequent corresponding season, 
she would infallibly encounter him there. So do, too with some other feeding grounds where he had at times revealed himself. But all these seemed only his casual stopping places in Ocean Inn, so to speak, not his places of prolonged abode. And where Ahab's chances of accomplishing the, his object have hitherto been spoken of, allusion has only been made to whatever wayside, antecedent, extra prospects were his, ere a particular set time or place were attained, when all possibilities would become probabilities. And as Ahab fondly thought, every possibility the next thing to a certainty. That particular set time and place were conjoined in the one technical phrase, the season on the line. For there and then, for several consecutive years, Moby Dick had been periodically described, lingering in those waters for a while, as the sun in its annual round loiters for a predicted interval in any one sign of the zodiac. There it was too that most of the deadly encounters with the white whale had taken place. There the waves were storied with his deeds. There also was that tragic spot where the monomaniac old man had found the awful motive to his vengeance. But in the cautious com comprehensiveness and unloitering vigilance with which Ahab threw his brooding soul into this unfaltering hunt, he would not permit himself to rest all his hopes upon the one crowning fact above mentioned, however flattering it might be to those hopes, nor in the sleeplessness of his vow could he so tranquilize his unquiet heart as to postpone all intervening quest. Now the Pequot had sailed from Nantucket at the very beginning of the season on the line. No possible endeavor then could enable her commander to make the great passage southwards, double Cape Horn, and then running down 60 degrees of latitude, arrive in the equatorial Pacific in time to cruise there. Therefore, he must wait for the next ensuing season. Yet the premature hour of the Pequot sailing had perhaps been correctly selected by Ahab with a view to this very complexion of things. Because an interval of 365 days and nights was before him, an interval which, instead of impatiently enduring ashore, he would spend in a miscellaneous hunt. If by chance the white whale, spending his vacation in seas far remote from his periodical feeding ground, should turn up his wrinkled brow off the Persian Gulf, or in the Bengal Bay, or China Seas, or in any other waters haunted by his race. So that monsoons, pampas, nor'westers, harmatons, trades, any wind but the Levanter and Simum might blow Moby Dick into the devious zigzag world circle of Pequod's circumnavigating weight. But granting all this, yet regarded discreetly and coolly, seems it not but a mad idea, this, that in the broad boundless ocean, one solitary whale, even if encountered, should be thought capable of individual recognition from his hunter, even as a white bearded in Mufti in the thronged thoroughfares of Constantinople? Yes, for the peculiar snow white brow of Moby Dick and his snow white hump could not but be unmistakable. And have I not tallied the whale, Ahab would mutter to himself, as after poring over his charge till long after midnight, he would throw himself back in reveries, tallied him and shall he escape? His broad fins are bored and scalloped out like a lost sheep's ear. And here his mad mind would run on in a breathless race till the weariness and faintness of pondering came over him. And in the open air of the deck, he would seek to recover his strength. Ah, oh, God, what trances of torment does that man endure who is consumed with one unachieved revengeful desire. He sleeps with clenched hands and wakes with his own bloody nails in his palms. Often when forced from his hammock by exhausting and intolerably vivid dreams of the night, which resuming his own intense thoughts through the day, carried them on amid a clashing of frenzies, and whirled them round and round in his blazing brain till the very throbbing of his life spot became insufferable anguish. And when, as was sometimes the case, these spiritual throes in him heaved his being up from its base and a chasm seemed opening in him from which forked flames and lightning shot up and accursed fiends beckoned him to leap down among them. When this Helen himself yawned beneath him, a wild cry would be heard through the ship and with glaring eyes, Ahab would burst from his stateroom, so though escaping from the bed that was on fire. Yet these perhaps, instead of being the unsuppressible symptoms of some latent weakness or fight at his own resolve, were but the plainest tokens of his intensity. For at such times, Ahab, the scheming, unappeasedly steadfast hunter of the white whale, this Ahab that had gone to his hammock, was not the agent that so caused him to burst from it in horror again, 
The latter was the eternal living principle or soul in him. And in sleep being for the time disassociated from the characterizing mind, which at other times employed it for its other outer vehicle or agent, it spontaneously sought escape from the scorching contiguity of the frantic thing, of which for the time it was no longer an integral. But as the mind does not exist unless leagued with the soul, therefore it must have been that in Ahab's case, yielding up all his thoughts and fancies to his one supreme purpose, that purpose by its own sheer inveteracy of will, force itself against gods and devils into a kind of self-assumed independent being of its own, nay could grimly live and burn while the common vitality to which it was conjoined fled horror stricken from the unbidden and unfathered birth. Therefore, the tormented spirit that glared out of bodily eyes when what seemed Ahab rushed from his room was for the, for the time but a vacated thing, a formless somnambulistic being, a ray of living light to be sure, but without an object to color and therefore a blankness in itself. God help thee, old man, thy thoughts have created a creature in thee and he whose intense thinking thus makes him a Prometheus. A vulture feeds upon that heart forever. That vulture, the very creature he creates. Thank you. So far as what there may be of a narrative in this book, and indeed as indirectly touching one or two very interesting and curious particulars in the habits of sperm whales, the foregoing chapter in its earliest part is as important a one as will be found in this volume. But the leading matter of it requires to be still further and more familiarly enlarged upon in order to be adequately understood, and moreover to take away any incredulity which a profound ignorance of the entire subject may induce in some minds as to the natural variety of the main points of this affair. I care not to perform this part of my task methodically, but shall be content to produce the desired impression by separate citations of items practically or reliably known to me as a whale man, and from these citations, I take it, the conclusion aimed at will naturally follow of itself. First, I have personally known three instances where a whale, after receiving a harpoon, has effected a complete escape, and after an interval, in one instance of three years, has been again struck by the same hand and slain, when the two irons, both marked by the same private cipher, have been taken from the body. In the instance where three years intervened between the flinging of the two harpoons, and I think it may have been something more than that, the man who darted them happening in the interval to go in a trading ship on a voyage to Africa, went ashore there, joined a discovery party, and penetrated far into the interior, where he traveled for a period of nearly two years, often endangered by serpents, savages, tigers, poisonous miasmas, and all the other common perils incident to wandering in the heart of unknown regions. Meanwhile, the whale he had struck must also have been on its travels. No doubt it had thrice circumnavigated the globe, brushing with its flanks all the coasts of Africa, but to no purpose. This man and this whale again came together, and the one vanquished the other. I say I myself have known three instances similar to this. That is, in two of them I saw the whale struck, and upon the second attack saw the two irons with the respective marks cut in them, afterwards taken from the dead fish. In the three-year instance it so fell out that I was in the boat both times, first and last, and the last time distinctly recognized a peculiar sort of huge mole under the whale's eye, which I had observed upon three years Prius. I say three years, but I am pretty sure it was more than that. Here are three instances, then, which I personally know the truth of, but I have heard of many other instances from persons whose veracity in the matter there is no good grounds to impeach. Secondly, it is well known in the sperm whale fishery, however ignorant the world ashore may be of it, that there have been several memorable historical instances where a particular whale in the ocean has been at distant times and places popularly cognizable. Why such a whale became thus marked was not altogether and originally owing to his bodily peculiarities as distinguished from other whales, for however peculiar in that respect any chance whale may be, they soon put an end to his peculiarities by killing him and boiling him down into a peculiarly valuable oil. No. 
The reason was this, that from the fatal experiences of the fishery there hung a terrible prestige of perilousness about such a whale as there did about Rinaldo Rinaldinini, insomuch that most fishermen were content to recognize him by merely touching their tarpaulins when he would be discovered lounging by them on the sea without seeking to cultivate a more intimate acquaintance. Like some poor devils ashore that happen to know an irascible great man, they make distant, unobtrusive salutations to him in the street, lest if they pursued the acquaintance further, they might receive a summary thump for their presumption. But not only did each of these famous whales enjoy great individual celebrity, nay, you may call it an ocean-wide renown, not only was he famous in life and now is immortal in folksal stories after death, but he was admitted into all the rights, privilege, and distinctions of a name, had as much a name indeed as Cambyses or Caesar, was it not so, old Timor Tom, thou famed leviathan, scarred like an iceberg, who so long didst lurk in the oriental straits of that name, whose spout was off-seen from the palmy beach of Ambay? Was it not so, O New Zealand Jack, thou terror of all cruises that cross their wakes in the vicinity of the tattoo land? Was it not so, O Morquan, king of Japan? whose lofty jet they say at times assume the semblance of a snow-white cross against the sky. Was it not so, O Don Miguel, thou Chilean whale, marked like an old tortoise with mystic hieroglyphics upon the back? In plain prose, here are four whales as well known to the students of cetacean history as Marius or Scylla to the classic scholar. But this is not all. New Zealand Tom and Don Miguel, after at various times creating great havoc among the boats of different vessels, were finally gone in quest of, systematically hunted out, chased, and killed by valiant whaling captains who heaved up their anchors with that expressed object as much in view as in setting out through the Narragansett woods. Captain Church of old had it in his mind to capture that notorious, murderous, savage Anawan, the headmost warrior of the Indian, King Philip. I do not know where I can find a better place than just here to make mention of one or two things which to me seem important, as in printed form establishing in all respects the reasonableness of the whole story of the white whale, most especially the catastrophe. For this is one of those disheartening instances where truth requires full as much bolstering as error. So ignorant are most landsmen of some of the plainest and most palpable wonders of the world that without some hints touching the plain facts, historical and otherwise, of the fishery, they might scout at Moby Dick as a monstrous fable, or still worse and more detestable, a hideous and intolerable allegory. First, though most men have some vague flitting ideas of the general perils of the grand fishery, yet they have nothing like a fixed, vivid conception of those perils and the frequency with which they recur. One reason, perhaps, is that not one in fifty of the actual disasters and deaths by casualties in the fishery ever finds a public record at home, however transient and immediately forgotten that record. Do you suppose that that poor fellow there, who this moment perhaps caught by the whale line off the coast of New Guinea, is being carried down to the bottom of the sea by the sounding leviathan, do you suppose that that poor fellow's name will appear in the newspaper obituary you will read tomorrow at your breakfast? No because the mails are very irregular between here and New Guinea. In fact, did you ever hear what might be called regular news, direct or indirect, from New Guinea? Yet, I will tell you that upon one particular voyage which I made to the Pacific, among many others, we spoke 30 different ships, 
every one of which had had a death by a whale, some of them more than one, and three that had lost a boat's crew. For God's sake, be economical with your lamps and candles. Not a gallon you burn, but at least one drop of man's blood was spilled for it. Secondly, people ashore have indeed some indefinite ideal, idea that a whale is an enormous creature of enormous power. But I have ever found that when narrating to them some specific example of this twofold enormousness, they have significantly complimented me upon my facetiousness. When I declare upon my soul, I had no more idea of being facetious than Moses when he wrote the history of the plagues of Egypt. But fortunately, the special point I here seek can be established upon testimony entirely independent of my own. That point is this. The sperm whale is in some cases sufficiently powerful, knowing, and judiciously malicious, as with direct aforethought to stave in, utterly destroy, and sink a large ship. And what is more, the sperm whale has done it. First, in the year 1820, the ship Essex, Captain Pollard of Nantucket, was cruising in the Pacific Ocean. One day she saw spouts, lowered her boats, and gave chase to a shoal of sperm whales. Ere long, several of the whales were wounded, when suddenly a very large whale escaping from the boats issued from the shoal and bore directly down upon the ship. Dashing his forehead against her hull, he so stove her in that in less than 10 minutes, she settled down and fell over. Not a surviving plank of her has been seen since. After the severest exposure, part of the crew reached the land in their boats. Being returned home at last, Captain Pollard once more sailed for the Pacific in command of another ship. But the gods shipwrecked him again upon unknown rocks and breakers. For the second time, his ship was utterly lost, and forthwith, forswearing the sea, he has never tempted it since. At this day, Captain Pollard is a resident of Nantucket. I have seen Owen Chase, who was chief mate of the Essex at the time of the tragedy. I have read his plain and faithful narrative. I have conversed with his son, and all this within a few miles of the scene of the catastrophe. The following are extracts from Chase's narrative. Every fact seemed to warrant me in concluding that it was anything but chance which directed his operations. He made two several attacks upon the ship at a short interval between them, both of which, according to their direction, were calculated to do us the most injury by being made ahead and thereby combining the speed of the two objects for the shock, to effect which the exact maneuvers which he made were necessary. His aspect was most horrible, and such as indicated resentment and fury. He came directly from the shoal which we had just before entered, and in which we had struck three of his companions, as if fired with revenge for their sufferings. Again, at all events, the whole circumstances taken together, all happening before my eyes and producing at the time impressions in my mind of decided calculating mischief on the part of the whale, many of which impressions I cannot now recall, induce me to be satisfied that I am correct in my opinion. Here are his reflections sometime after quitting the ship during a black night in an open boat, when almost despairing of reaching any hospitable shore. The dark ocean and swelling waters were nothing. The fears of being swallowed up by some dreadful tempest or dashed upon hidden rocks with all the other ordinary subjects of fearful contemplation 
seemed scarcely entitled to a moment's thought. The dismal looking wreck and the horrid aspect and revenge of the whale wholly engrossed my reflections until day again made its appearance. In another place, page 45, he speaks of the mysterious and mortal attack of the animal. <clears throat> Secondly, the ship Union, also of Nantucket, was in the year 1807 totally lost off the Azores by a similar onset, but the authentic particulars of this catastrophe I have never chanced to encounter, though from whale hunters I have now and then heard casual allusions to it. Thirdly, some 18 or 20 years ago, Commodore J, then commanding an American sloop of war of the first class, happened to be dining with a party of whaling captains on board a Nantucket ship in the harbor of Oahu, Sandwich Islands. Conversation turning upon whales, the Commodore was pleased to be skeptical touching the amazing strength ascribed to them by the professional gentlemen present. He peremptorily denied, for example, that any whale could so smite his stout sloop of war as to cause her to leak so much as a thimbleful. Very good, but there is more coming. Some weeks after, the Commodore set sail in this impregnable craft for Valparaiso, but he was stopped on the way by a portly sperm whale that begged a few moments confidential business with him. That business consisted in fetching the Commodore's craft such a thwack that with all the pumps going, he made straight for the nearest port to heave down and repair. I am not superstitious, but I consider the Commodore's interview with that whale as providential. Was not Saul of Tarsus converted from unbelief by a similar fright? I tell you, the sperm whale will stand no nonsense. I will now refer you to Langsdorff's voyages for a little circumstance in point, particularly interesting to the writer hereof. Langsdorff, you must know, by the way, was attached to the Russian Admiral Krusenstern's famous discovery expedition in the beginning of the present century. Captain Langsdorff thus begins his 17th chapter. By the 13th of May, our ship was ready to sail, and the next day we were out in the open sea on our way to Okotosh. The weather was very clear and fine, but so intolerably cold, we were obliged to keep on our fur clothing. For some days, we had very little wind. It was not till the 19th that a brisk gale from the northwest sprang up. An uncommon large whale, the body of which was larger than the ship itself, lay almost at the surface of the water, but was not perceived by anyone on board till the moment when the ship, which was in full sail, was almost upon him, so that it was impossible to prevent its striking against him. We were thus placed in the most eminent danger, as this gigantic creature, setting up its back, raised the ship three feet at least out of the water. The masts reeled and the sails fell all together, while we who were below all sprang instantly upon the deck, concluding we had struck upon some rock. Instead of this, we saw the monster sailing off with the utmost gravity and solemnity. Captain DeWolf applied immediately to the pumps to examine whether or not the vessel had received any damage from the shock, but we found that very happily it had escaped entirely uninjured. Now the Captain DeWolf here alluded to as commanding the ship in question is a New Englander, who after a long life of unusual adventures as a sea captain, this day resides in the village of Dorchester near Boston. I have the honor of being a nephew of his. I have particularly questioned him concerning this passage in Langsdorff. He substantiates every word. The ship, however, was by no means a large one. Russian craft built on the Siberian coast and purchased by my uncle after bartering away the vessel in which he sailed from home. In that up and down manly book of old fashioned adventure, so full too of honest wonders, the voyage of Lina Wafer, one of ancient Dampier's old chums, I found a little matter set down, so like that, just quoted from Langsdorff, that I cannot forbear inserting it here for a cooperative example, if such be needed. Lionel, it seems, was on his way to John Ferdinando, as he calls the modern Juan Fernandez. 
In our way thither, he says, about four o'clock in the morning, when we were about 150 leagues from the main of America, our ship felt a terrible shock, which put our men in such consternation that they could hardly tell where they were or what to think. But everyone had began to prepare for death. And indeed, the shock was so sudden and violent that we took it for granted the ship had struck against a rock. But when the amazement was a little over, we cast the lead and sounded, but found no ground. The suddenness of the shock made the guns leap in their carriages, and several of the men were shaken out of their hammocks. Captain Davis, who lay with his head on a gun, was thrown out of his cabin. Lionel then goes on to impute the shock to an earthquake and seems to substantiate the imputation by stating that a great earthquake somewhere about that time did actually do great mischief to the Spanish land. But I should not much wonder if in the darkness of that early hour of the morning, the shock was after all caused by an unseen whale vertically bumping the hull from beneath. I might proceed with several more examples, one way or another known to me, of great power and malice at times of the sperm whale. In more than one instance, he has been known not only to chase the assailing boats back to their ships, but to pursue the ship itself and long withstand all the lances hurled at him from its decks. The English ship Pusey Hall can tell a story on that head, and as far as his strength, let me say that there have been examples where the lines attached to a running sperm whale have in a calm been transferred to the ship and secured there. The whale towing her great hull through the water as a horse walks off with a cart. Again, it is very often observed that if the sperm whale, once struck, is allowed time to rally, he then acts, not so often with blind rage as with willful, deliberate designs of destruction to his pursuers, nor is it without conveying some eloquent indication of his character, that upon being attacked, he will frequently open his mouth and retain it in that dread expansion for several consecutive minutes. But I must be content with only one more and a concluding illustration, a remarkable and most significant one, by which you will not fail to see that not only is the most marvelous event in this book corroborated by plain facts of the present day, but that these marvels, like all marvels, are mere repetitions of the ages, so that for the millionth time we say amen with Solomon. Verily, there is nothing new under the sun, in the sixth Christian century lived Procopius, a Christian magistrate of Constantinople in the days when Justinian was emperor and Belisarius general. As many know, he wrote the history of his own times, a work every way of uncommon value. By the best authorities, he has always been considered a most trustworthy and unexaggerating historian, except in some one or two particulars, not at all affecting the matter presently to be mentioned. Now, in the history of his, Procopius mentions that during the term of his prefecture at Constantinople, a great sea monster was captured in the neighboring Propontius, or Sea of Marmora, after having destroyed vessels at intervals in those waters for a period of more than 50 years. A fact thus set down in substantial history cannot easily be gainsaid, nor is there any reason it should be. Of what precise species this sea monster was is not mentioned. But as he destroyed ships, as well as for other reasons, he must have been a whale, and I am strongly inclined to think a sperm whale, and I will tell you why. For a long time, I fancied that the sperm whale had been always unknown in the Mediterranean and the deep waters connecting with it. Even now, I am certain that those seas are not, and perhaps never can be, in the present constitution of things, a place for his habitual gregarious resort. But further investigations have recently proved to me that in modern times there have been isolated instances of the presence of the sperm whale in the Mediterranean. I am told on good authority that on the Barbary coast, a Commodore Davis of the British Navy found the skeleton of a sperm whale. Now as a vessel of war readily passes through the Dardanelles, hence a sperm whale could, by the same route, pass out of the Mediterranean into the Propontis. In the Propontis, as far as I can learn, None of that peculiar substance called brit is to be found, the ailment of the right whale. But I have every reason to believe that the food of the sperm whale, squid or cuttlefish, lurks at the bottom of the sea because large creatures, but by no means the largest of that sort, have been found at its surface. If then you properly put these statements together and reason upon them a bit, 
you will clearly perceive that according to all human reasoning, Procopius, a sea monster that for half a century stole the ships of the Roman emperor, must in all probability have been a sperm whale. Reading chapter 46. Surmises. Though consumed with the hot fire of his purpose, Ahab in all his thoughts and actions ever had in view the ultimate capture of Moby Dick, though he seemed ready to sacrifice all mortal interests to that one passion. Nevertheless, it may have been that he was by nature and long habituation far too wedded to a fiery whaleman's ways altogether to abandon the collateral prosecution of the voyage. Or at least if this were otherwise, there were not wanting other motives much more influential with him. It would be refining too much, perhaps, even considering his monomania to hint that his vindictiveness towards the white whale might have been have possibly extended itself in some degree to all sperm whales, and that the more monsters he slew, by so much the more he multiplied the chances that each subsequently encountered whale would prove to be the hated one he hunted. But if such an hypothesis be indeed exceptionable, there were still additional considerations which, though not so strictly according with the wildness of his ruling passion, yet were by no means incapable of swaying him. To accomplish his object, Ahab must use tools, and of all tools used in the shadow of the moon, men are most apt to get out of order. He knew, for example, that however magnetic his ascendancy in some respects was over Starbuck, yet that ascendancy did not cover the complete spiritual man any more than mere corporeal superiority involves intellectual mastership. For to the purely spiritual, the intellectual but stand in a sort of corporeal relation. Starbuck's body and Starbuck's coerced will were Ahab's. So long as Ahab kept his magnet at Starbuck's brain, still he knew that for all this, the chief mate and his soul abhorred the captain's request. And could he, would joyfully disintegrate himself from it or even frustrate it. It might be that a long interval were to elapse ere the white whale was seen. During that long interval, Starbuck would ever be apt to fall into open relapses of rebellion against his captain's leadership, unless some ordinary, prudential, circumstantial influences were brought to bear upon him. Not only that, but the subtle insanity of Ahab respecting Moby Dick was no ways more significantly manifested than in his superlative sense and shrewdness in foreseeing that, for the present, the hunt should in some way be stripped of that strange imaginative impiousness which naturally invested it that the full terror of the voyage must be kept withdrawn into the obscure background. For a few men's courage is proof against protracted meditation unrelieved by action. That, when they stood their long night watches, his officers and men must have some nearer things to think of than Moby Dick. For however eagerly and impetuously the savage crew had hailed the announcement of his quest, yet all sailors of all sorts are more or less capricious and unreliable, they live in the varying outer weather, and they inhale its fickleness, and when retained, for any object remote and blank in the pursuit, however promissory of life and passion in the end, it is above all things requisite that temporary interests and employment should intervene and hold them healthily suspended for the final dash. Nor was Ahab unmindful of another thing. In times of strong emotion, mankind disdain all base considerations, but such times are evanescent. The permanent constitutional condition of the manufactured man, thought Ahab, is sordidness, granting that the white whale fully incites the hearts of this my savage crew and playing round their savageness even breeds a certain generous knight errantism in them. Still, while for the love of it they give chase to Moby Dick, they must also have food for their more common daily appetites. For even the high, lifted, and chivalric crusaders of old times were not content to travel 2,000 miles of land to fight for their holy sepulchre without committing burglaries, picking pockets, and gaining other pious perquisites by the way. Had they been strictly held to their one final and romantic object, that final and romantic object too many would have turned from in disgust. I will not strip these men, thought Ahab, of all hopes of cash. I cash. They may scorn cash now, but let some months go by and no perspective promise of it to them. And then this same quiescent cash, all at once mutinying in them, this same cash would soon cashier Ahab. Nor was there wanting still another precautionary motive more related to Ahab personally, having impulsively, it is probable, and perhaps somewhat prematurely revealed the prime but private purpose of the Pequod's voyage, 
Ahab was now entirely conscious that, in so doing, he had indirectly laid himself open to the unanswerable charge of usurpation. With perfect impunity, both moral and legal, his crew, if so disposed, and to that end competent, could refuse all further obedience to him, and even violently wrest from him the command. From even the barely hinted imputation of usurpation and the possible consequences of such a suppressed impression gaining ground, Ahab must, of course, been most anxious to protect himself. That protection could only consist in his own predominating brain and heart and hand, backed by a heedful, closely calculating attention to every minute atmospheric influence which it was possible for his crew to be subjected to. For all these reasons, then, and others perhaps too analytic to be verbally developed here, Ahab plainly saw that he must still, in a good degree, continue true to the natural, nominal purpose of the Pequod's voyage, observe all customary usages, and not only that, but force himself to evince all his well-known, passionate interest in the general pursuit of his profession. Be all this as it may, his voice was now often heard hailing the three mastheads and admonishing them to keep a bright lookout and not omit reporting even a porpoise. This vigilance was not long without reward. Chapter 46 in German Mutmaßungen Hatte Ahab zwar verzehrt von der Flamme seines Vorhabens all seinen Dichten und Trachten stets dies schließlich Überwältigung Moby Dicks vor Augen, war er auch bereit, diese einen Leidenschaft, alle irdischen Interessen zu opfern, so war er seiner Natur und langen Gewohnheit nach einem kühnen Walfingerleben zu sehr verbunden, um nicht gleichzeitig den eigentlichen Zweck der Fahrt im Auge zu behalten. Wäre das nicht der Fall gewesen, so hätte es ihm nicht in anderen triftigen Beweggründen dazu gefehlt. Vielleicht hieß es trotz all seiner Besessenheit, die Sache auf die Spitze treiben, wolle man darauf hinweisen, seine Rachsucht gegenüber dem weißen Wal könne sich möglicherweise auf alle Portwale übertragen haben. Und je mehr dieser Ungeheuer er erschlug, umso größer sei die Wahrscheinlichkeit, dass der nächste Wal, dem er begegnete, sich als der Verhasste herausstellte, dem er nachjagte. War aber eine solche Annahme wirklich nicht zu vertreten, so kamen noch andere Erwägungen in Betracht, die, wenn auch nicht so sehr mit der Wildheit der ihn beherrschenden Leidenschaft in Einklang standen, ihn aber dennoch zum Einfluss vermochten. Um dieses Ziel zu erreichen, brauchte Ahab Werkzeuge und von allen Werkzeugen, die wir unter dem Mond benutzen, sind die Menschen diejenigen, die am meisten dazu neigen, unseren Befehlen ungehorsam zu werden. So wusste er zum Beispiel, dass er bei allem suggestiven Einfluss, den er in gewisser Beziehung auf Starbuck ausübte, diesen Mann nur insoweit beherrschte, als reine körperliche Überlegenheit, geistige Meisterschaft in sich schließt, denn zu dem rein Geistigen steht das Intellektuelle in einer Art körperlicher Beziehung. Starbucks Körper und sein eingeengter Wille waren Ahab so lange untertan, als Ahabs Magnet auf Starbucks Gehirn wirkte. Aber er wusste, dass dem Obermaat trotz allem das Vorhaben seines Kapitäns in der Tiefe seiner Seele verhasst war und dass er, wenn irgend möglich, sich selbst mit Freuden daraus halten oder es vereiteln würde. Unter Umständen dauerte es noch lange, ehe der weiße Wal gesichtet wurde. Während dieser langen Zwischenzeit würde Starbuck immer geneigt sein, in offene Auflehnung gegen seines Kapitäns Führerschaft zu verfallen, wenn er nicht auf irgendwelche geeignete alltägliche Weise beschäftigt war. Das war es nicht allein. In nichts zeigte sich der verschlagene Wahnsinn Ahabs, was Moby Dick betraf, mehr als in seinem Schafblick, und seiner Arglist in der vorausschauenden Erkenntnis, dass die Jagd vorläufig irgendwie der seltsam fantastischen Verrücktheit entkleidet werden musste, von der sie natürlich umgeben war, dass das ganze Schreckliche dieser Fahrt in den dunklen Hintergrund zurücktreten musste, denn nur wenige Menschen vermögen, gegenüber fortwährendem, durch keinerlei Tätigkeit abgelenktem Nachdenken den Mut zu bewahren, dass seine Offiziere und Mannschaften auf ihren langen Nachtwachen an näher liegende Dinge als an Moby Dick zu denken hatten. Zwar hatte die wilde Meute eifrig und ungestüm der Ankündigung seines Vorhabens zugestimmt, aber alle Matrosen sind nicht mehr oder weniger launisch und unzuverlässig. Sie leben in einer unbeständigen Witterung und nehmen deren Wankelmütigkeit in sich auf. 
und werden sie für ein in der Ferne liegendes und in seiner Durchführung noch unklares Unternehmen in Anspruch genommen, so viel ihnen dies auch für ihr Leben und ihre Leidenschaft versprechen mag, so heißt es vor allen Dingen, ihr Interesse fesseln und sie bis zum Endkampf beschäftigen, um sie auf eine vernünftige Weise in Spannung zu halten. Noch etwas anderes behielt Ahab im Auge. In momentan starker Erregung ist der Mensch über Erwägungen geringfügiger Art erhaben, aber solche Zeiten gehen vorüber. Auf die Dauer, überlegte sich Ahab, ist der tätige Mensch gemeiner Natur. Zugegeben, dass der Weiße Wal die Gemüter seiner wilden Mannschaft in Wallungen gebracht hatte und sie in ihrer Wildheit in Gefühlen eines gewissen, edelmütigen, fahrenden Rittertums Raum gaben, so mussten sie doch, während sie ihre Ehre da reinsetzten, Moby Dick nachzujagen, ihren gewöhnlichen täglichen Appetit befriedigen können. Waren doch selbst die hochmütigen und ritterlichen Kreuzfahrer in alten Zeiten nicht mehr damit zufrieden, 2000 Meilen durch das Land zu ziehen, um für ihr heiliges Grab zu kämpfen, ohne unterwegs zu rauben und zu plündern und sich andere fromme Nebeneinkünfte zu verschaffen. Hätte man sie streng an ihr einziges romantisches Endziel gehalten, so hätten zu viele den Geschmack daran verloren. Ich will diesen Männern, sagte sich Ahab, nicht jede Hoffnung auf Bargeld, ja Bargeld nehmen. Jetzt weise den Gedanken an dieses Bargeld vielleicht von sich, aber lass einmal einige Monate vergehen und es ist immer noch keine Bezahlung zu erwarten. So wird dieser selbe in ihnen schlummender Gedanke an Bargeld plötzlich aufbegehren und Ahab wird die Zeche zahlen müssen. Noch ein anderer, Ahab selbst betreffender Umstand war vorsorglich zu bedenken. Nachdem er sich dazu hatte verleiten lassen, wahrscheinlich etwas voreilig den grundsätzlichen, wenn auch privaten Zweck dieser Reise der Bequot preiszugeben, so war er sich dessen völlig bewusst, dass er sich damit gewissermaßen eine unverantwortliche Überschreitung seiner Befugnisse angemaßt hatte und dass seine Mannschaft ihm von gesetzlichen und moralischen Standpunkt aus völlig ungestraft den Gehorsam verweigern, ja ihn sogar seines Kommandos entsetzen konnte wenn sie etwa auf diese Gedanken kämen. Gegen den leisesten Verdacht, eine solche Überschreitung seiner Befugnisse und die möglichen Folgen eines solchen Einbruchs sich zu schützen, musste Ahab natürlich ängstlich bemüht sein. Diesen Schutz könnte ihm nur seine kluge, mutige und tatkräftige Überlegenheit gewähren. Und diese musste durch eine sorgfältige, in jeder Minute berechnende Beobachtung der Stimmungseinflüsse gestärkt werden, denen seine Mannschaft unterworfen sein konnte. All diese und vielleicht noch andere Überlegungen, die hier zu sehr ins Einzelne führen würden, ließen Ahab einsehen, dass er in weitem Umfang den gegebenen wirklichen Zweck der Pequot-Reise verfolgen, den üblichen Betrieb aufrechterhalten und sich selbst dazu zwingen musste, sein allgemein bekanntes leidenschaftliches Interesse für die normalen Aufgaben seines Berufs an den Tag zu legen. So hörte man dann seine Stimme jetzt öfters die drei Ausdrucksposten anrufen und sie ermahnen, die Augen offen zu halten und nichts zu versäumen. Selbst einen Tümmler zu melden, diese Wachsamkeit blieb dann auch nicht lange unbelohnt. Chapter 47, The Mapmaker It was a cloudy, sultry afternoon. The seamen were lazily lounging about the decks or vacantly gazing over into the lead-colored waters. Queequeg and I were mildly employed, weaving what is called a sword mat for an additional lashing to our boat. So still and subdued, and yet somehow preluding was all the scene. And such an incantation of reverie lurked in the air that each silent sailor seemed resolved into his own invisible self. I was the attendant or page of Queequeg while busy at the mat. As I kept passing and repassing the filling or woof of marline between the long yarns of the warp, using my own hand for the shuttle, and Queequeg, as Queequeg, standing sideways, ever and anon slid his heavy oaken sword between the threads, and idly looking off upon the water, carelessly and unthinkingly drove home every yarn. I say so strange a dreaminess that did there then reign all over the ship and all over the sea, only broken by the intermitting dull sound of the sword, that it seemed as if this were the loom of time. And I myself were a shuttle mechanically weaving and weaving away at the fates. 
There lay the fixed threads of the warp subject to but one single, ever returning, unchanging vibration. And that vibration merely enough to admit of the crosswise interblending of other threads with its own. This warp seemed necessity. And here, thought I, with my own hand, I ply my own shuttle and weave my own destiny into these unalterable threads. Meantime, Queequeg's impulsive indifferent sword, sometimes hitting the wharf sl woof slantingly or crookedly, or strongly or weakly, as the case may be, and by this difference in the concluding blow, producing a corresponding contrast in the final aspect of the completed fabric. The savage's sword, thought I, which thus finally shapes and fashions both warp and woof, this easy, an easy indifferent sword must be chance, I chance, free will, and necessity, no wise incompatible, all interweavingly working together. The straight warp of necessity, not to be swerved from its ultimate course, it's every alternating vibration, indeed only tending to that, free will still free to ply her shuttle between given threads and chance, though restrained in its play within the right lines of necessity and sideways in its motions modified by free will, though thus prescribed to by chance, by both. Chance by turns rules either and has the last featuring blow at events. Thus we were weaving and weaving away when I started at a sound of so strange, long drawn and musically wild and unearthly that the ball of free will dropped from my hand. And I stood gazing up at the clouds whence that voice dropped like a wing. High aloft in the cross trees was that mad gay header, Tashtigo, his body was reaching eagerly forward, his hand out stretched out like a wand. And at brief sudden intervals, he continued his cries. To be sure the same sound was that very moment, perhaps being heard all over the seas from hundreds of whalemen's, whales, whalemen's lookouts perched as high in the air. But from few of those lungs could that accustomed old cry have derived such a marvelous cadence as from Tashtigo the Indians. As he stood hovering over you half suspended in air, so wildly and eagerly peering towards the horizon, you would have thought him some prophet or seer beholding the shadows of fate and by those wild cries announcing their coming. There she blows, there, 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 she blows, she blows. Where away? On the lee beam, about two miles off, a school of them. Instantly, all was commotion. The sperm whale blows as a clock twicks with the same undeviating and reliable uniformity. And thereby whalemen distinguish this fish from other tribes of his genus. There go flukes was now the cry from Tashtigo and the whales disappeared. Quick steward, cried Ahab, time, time. Doughboy hurried below, glanced at, his, at the watch and reported the exact minute to Ahab. The ship was now kept away from the wind and she went gently rolling before it. Tashtigo reporting that the whales had gone down, heading to leeward. We confidently looked to see them again directly in advance of our bows. For that singular craft at times evinced by the sperm whale when sounding with his head in one direction, he nevertheless, while concealed beneath the surface, mills round and swiftly swims off in the opposite quarter. This deceitfulness of his could not now be in action. For there was no reason to suppose that the fish seen by Tashtigo had been in any way alarmed or indeed knew at all of our vicinity. One of the men selected for shipkeepers, that is, those not appointed to the boats, by this time relieved the Indian at the main mast ahead. The sailors at the fore and mizzen had come down. The line tubs were fixed in their places. The cranes were thrust out. The main yard was backed and the three boats swung over the sea like three samphire baskets over high cliffs. 
Outside of the bulwarks, their eagle, eager crews with one hand clung to the rail, while one foot was expectantly poised on the gunwale. So looked the long line of men of war's men about to throw themselves on board an enemy's ship. But at this critical instant, a sudden exclamation was heard that took every eye from the whale. With a start, all glared at dark Ahab, who was surrounded by five dusky phantoms that seemed fresh formed out of air. <laughs> 